hi Emma and thank you so much for joining me on the Rescue Tales podcast today. Thanks for having me. Before we jump into the topic for today, which is really helping people think about what they should consider before even making the decision to adopt a rescue dog and, you know, some of your key tips and strategies as to how people can support the dog through the initial days and weeks. Tell us about what you do and your background, Emma. Well, I kind of came into rescue by hook or by crook, and I've been working with and alongside France's second largest shelter for about eight years now. But I also work with smaller associations to support them with rescue problems. And I also have got private practice where I'm working with dogs who've got a history of aggression and bites. So it's kind of a, a, a mix of, of lots of different things. And that's that's my kind of rescue background. But I'm also heavily involved in assessment in the UK. So partly why I'm kind of a bit nomadic at the moment. And so there's that side having taught and worked in business businesses for for oh 20 years before I decided to to kind of do more things at a relaxed pace allegedly and then it all ended up being pretty crazy anyway that's fantastic so I'm being really nosy when you say assessment what do you mean GCSEs mainly so we oh uh, work, okay yeah people education <laughs> People education. I'm working with teachers as well. So I've got a, t- a team of, in normal circumstances, a team of about 90 examiners. And that's kind of one of my passions, really, is it, it's not so much about the animals. The animals can be much more simple than the people. Um, working with people can be a, a bit of a challenge, uh, especially in the rescue world, particularly where there are kind of, I don't know, I was talking about this to a person in rescue yesterday a mismatch between people's expectations of the dogs that they might be able to adopt and the dogs that we've got. So sometimes I think I use that term negotiated settlement from Karen Overall a lot. And that's a lot of what I'm doing is a lot of negotiated settlements, whether it's with humans, whether it's in the work world, whether it's with rescue, whether it's with animals. Wow. So, to, I mean, maybe that's a really great, you know, point to, to kick off the, the, the conversation is what are people's expectations and what are some of the mismatches in terms of what they expect and what they would get? I think it depends because I think there, there are different reasons why people want to adopt a dog. So the first is kind of the very typical experience in France when I first started at the shelter was kind of a secondhand dog, a cheap dog kind of like the rescue uh, sites in the UK, like Dogs for Homes, or I can't remember all the names of their sites, that really they just want a cheap dog. And they're not necessarily bothered about pedigree so much, but that's kind of nice if they get it, but it's their kind of way of getting a cheap dog. So that's the first kind. And we get a lot of those adopters that, that come in and want just basically a, a dog that's been owned by somebody else before. And, and sometimes it's for economic value reasons. And then we have people who adopt for, I, I guess what I would say, ethical reasons. And I'm, I'm kind of protective about this little category because it comes under a lot of stick from particularly people who are breed advocates and sometimes people who are, you know, people who I'd consider to be eco-feminist, people who are very supportive of, of this kind of world, who seem to see the rescue world as a bit of a cult and that, you know, we get all of these labels like virtue signaling and people who are trying to make themselves feel holy and, and all of these things that people are, who are making an ethical choice. So we get people who really it's kind of like being the being vegan of the uh, the animal companionship world that they're making a choice that that they don't necessarily care about breed or these are the people who might be sharing things like adopt those shop kind of mottos and then we get people who just like dogs you know and don't care and 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 we get people from all walks of life who come in we get people who who re- who come in and these are the quietest people these are people who never send photos they come in and they say I want to take the dog who's been here the longest and they want to make a difference, you know? So we get the, the kind of adopters who are more interested in market value, I guess. Not that it's the idea of the dog as a commodity almost. I'm not saying that's a bad thing. It's just the way that they see it. And a lot of the studies that exist about why people adopt which dogs and so on, particularly studies based in the US, very much about market commodity, some breed, gender, uh, sex, not gender. So we get those factors that influence it. So for instance, these are at play in our shelter. So if we get a small two-year-old female uh, dog in especially a pedigree dog like a little Yorkshire Terrier or a little Bichon that dog will be gone in the afternoon 
the, that, that dog will not hang around. So we have those kind of market forces at work, just as you see in the in the US. But we also have people who come and adopt our kind of like wonky dogs and dogs look like look like they've been cut out from five different dogs and stuck together. And, you know, the old dogs and people who are just interested in adopting, you know, a dog who needs a home. So we have people who adopt for all kinds of reasons. And it's understanding, I think, the different reasons that people might adopt that can sometimes be a bit of a challenge for rescues. Yeah, it's it's certainly a diverse set of reasons there. Yeah, no, and, I, and, and it's interesting, you know, especially the point you make about, you know, the, that the second group of, of people who often get, you know, a lot of feedback let's say let's say in terms of of the choice so I, I don't like to take a hardline view of anything in in life no. but I do I really do think that given given the rise in demand for dogs particularly in the pandemic and we look at, at now the pressure on many of the animal charities and shelters because so many of these dogs that were purchased are being sent back and how mm -hmm. that demand and, and many people made a very informed decision, but some haven't. And that demand has mm -hmm. led to an increase in dog theft. It has led mm -hmm. to an increase in very poor breeding practice, which is just cruel mm -hmm. to the animals. And mm -hmm. there are some great breeders out there, but I, I think we just need to be aware of the impact of our choices and do our research really well. Because one of the questions you know I had for you is what should people consider before deciding to adopt a dog? And I suppose there's actually a question of, what what do you need to consider before even thinking about a dog, regardless of whether you where, where you know wherever you source it from, from mm -hmm. a good breeder or you adopt it, whatever. What are the things that you should be thinking about to make sure that you don't end up sending that dog back just because you can't mm -hmm. cope with it? Mm. Yeah, it always depends. Those are, that's my answer to everything. Is it depends. It's complicated, <laughs> and we don't know enough to know for sure. So those three things govern my life. So what you say is true, and I think is definitely true of the UK, perhaps the US, maybe Canada and so on. But working in France, you kind of see a different tension sometimes. Like, for instance, we haven't had a bounce back and there wasn't an enormous number of dogs that were produced and sold during the pandemic. So we didn't face that kind of a situation. So one of my dogs just decided that now is a really good time to get a squeaky toy oh. out. <laughs> <laughs> I'm ignoring her. So I, th I think that depends as well. That sometimes we we think, especially when we're from very individualistic cultures, like the US and like the UK tend to be, we don't necessarily think about the effect of culture on adoption and on dog production. Because there's no way on earth that a dog would sell for £4,000 in France. There just isn't. And there just wasn't that situation. We haven't had the bounce back. We haven't had a number of animals sent back to the shelters. What did affect us was the fact that vets weren't doing voluntary sterilizations, and that mostly affected the cats. So we've had a bigger population this time of cats. And I suspect that would be the problem with the pandemic, where vets weren't doing elective surgeries, where animals are free to make their own reproductive choices, like in Romania or off Spain or so on where there wasn't the kind of the governance that we normally have they mm. kept numbers fairly small so you know I think it again it depends and uh, yeah <laughs> it's complicated where yeah. we're talking about different cultures it, yeah absolutely absolutely and and um I, I think it's just one of those things where you I suppose that my advice to any individual would be you know before making that decision just make sure that you do thorough research and understand the implications of of the choice that that you make whether you, mm. you know ad adopt a dog or, or or buy one from from a breeder but I suppose one of my questions for you Emma then is is when we think specifically about dogs who've spent quite a bit of time in a shelter mm -hmm. um what are some of the potential challenges that people might face when adopting a dog that spent a bit of time or possibly not spent a huge amount of time in shelter but you know has come from a background where it suffered any kind of trauma has been you know dumped or been through something i think again it's complicated 
because so Liddy, who's here, she had th three years in the shelter before I adopted her, and there were a lot of reasons for that. One of my friends uh, is a social worker, yes. and she worked. To, she did her her dissertation on the adoption of Romanian orphans into the UK in the nineties, and a lot of the problems that she she sees with the animals that she works with in the shelter are the same problems that she saw with some of the children that were adopted from Romanian orphanages. In that, the ones who were quiet and shut down in the orphanages just like the same as our quiet shut down dogs in the, the shelter the ones who behave themselves if you like when you're looking at them as an external kind of viewer they tend to be the ones that have the most problem the most difficulties adjusting in some ways mm -hmm. and yet the ones who had formed a secure attachment to somebody before they went into the orphanages they were the ones who suffered the most in the orphanages the ones who had the worst behaviors in the orphanages and we see that with our dogs so Lydia in the shelter was well the first I was called in to assess her for euthanasia um because she had bitten a number of volunteers she'd been she, she'd been sent out uh, for adoption before we knew very much about her and she'd killed a cat and bitten the owner very severely and so when she came back she was traumatized and then bitten a number of volunteers and so on so when we're talking about dogs who have been in the shelter for a long time who have got very bad behaviors in the shelter Quite often, those are the dogs that when they get into the home, they're the ones who had enough, uh, who know how to form a secure attachment to somebody. So we had the same. There was another dog who she was just three kennels down from Liddy, my dog, Zena. And Zena could easily destroy a, an entire kennel in. She had constant diarrhea. She had constant health problems. She it was an escape artist. She uh, was aggressive with some of the volunteers, but then not with others. She, you know, all kinds of these problems. And also, I then started, like a lot of our shepherds, chasing a tail, which we then had to amputate. And um, so I'm in discussion with the vet, and the vet's saying, look, if we amputate a tail, she's just going to start on another body part. She's just going to start on a feet or a flank. So we had to make sure that she had medication to make sure that didn't happen and so on. But knowing Zena in her placement, where she is now with her very happy family, is to see a dog who just went from the shelter and went, and the same with Liddy. She, she got here and it was like, right, I'm here. And then on the other hand, you can have dogs who are very well behaved in the shelter, like my last old Malinois. She was incredibly well behaved in the, the shelter, very friendly, really easy to put with every other dog that you put her with, you know, really super with the volunteers couldn't understand for the life of us why she was in for such a long time she went through seven owners before she came to live with me finally that was the kind of that was her story and when I got her into the house you could tell why because she had in a huge separation anxiety which we'll not talk about um mm -hmm. I know later but she would destroy doors she would get out through the doors she was she's 14 and she'd broken a bark you know she'd oh barked that God. much in her life that she had no bark left she would nip and bite chill Children, you know, perfect dog in the shelter, absolute demon in the So I think it's very difficult to generalize and to, for instance, to use shelter assessments, because when you see a quiet dog in a shelter, that's not necessarily a dog that will be quiet in the house. and well behaved. You know, you can be super social and so on and still have enormous behavioral problems. And the dogs who do suffer in the shelter are the ones who are often the ones who'd formed a secure attachment mm. and were removed, particularly at a particular age. So I usually say between that 11 months, dogs who come in at 11 months yeah. um, to 12 months, they often really struggle. And they often go on if they've not been socialized and they're from a you know bad gene pool in the first place mm. then they can go on to be the ones that stay with us for years mm. and then are actually absolutely fine when they get into a home so you can see dogs who are you know really really struggling in kennels and then absolutely fine in the home and have no behavior problem well Lydia has got a few behavior problems she'll still snap and bark at other dogs and you know can't let anybody in without a, a very careful introduction but at the same time it's nothing like her behavior in kennels in terms of the destruction and the behaviors yeah. that she showed in kennels. Yeah. So it, it, it's a challenge really to know, you know, from the dogs that you've got in front of you, how they'll be in a home. But that's often how it goes that the well-adjusted ones mm. uh, are well-adjusted anyway and go on to be well-adjusted in the new homes and often, you know, it's super quick adoption. But the ones who are struggling in kennels often are the ones who, are, who really need a foster and a great in a home. So is that um, often the strategy with those dogs then is send them into a foster 
if we can we don't have a great foster network and foster poses its own problems uh, technical problems yeah um but yeah foster is great for that kind of dog just to get them in the home so I suppose because you know I completely understand what you're saying in terms of it really does depend and every dog is individual and they go through their own Mm. experiences and they respond to different environments and contexts in different ways but how how do you guide someone who's looking to adopt to make sure that they take home a dog that they are capable of supporting because when I think about when I was you know when I adopted my dog one of the things I I was really clear about is that this is my first dog I have no experience Mm -hmm. dealing with a dog that has severe behavioral issues I just feel it would be unfair for me to take a dog like that home I would fail Mm -hmm. it how do you advise someone who's looking and they're a first-time adopter and they just don't have that experience with with dogs partly it's just knowing the dogs that you've got in front of you and as much as you can and keeping the door open for afterwards that people think of as an adoption as like a single event and it shouldn't be a single event Mm -hmm. it shouldn't be that the the relationship ends when you sign the contract and you put the dog in the car it shouldn't end like that and there's a there's a big blame culture there's a huge blame culture like how hard is it to take a dog back to a shelter you know I kept a dog in foster for 18 months so he didn't have to go in the shelter you know so and I've been there and I also know because most of our um, adopters at that time, less so now, but more at that time, were drop-in adopters. 85% of our adoptions went through people who just turned. So they turned up, they had a look around, and they were window shopping for a dog, really. They didn't, okay. they weren't using social media. They weren't looking online. They just, you know, about 15% did, but not very many. So mm-hmm. who had dogs in foster? And that's a problem, one of the technical problems with foster that I said before, that they don't leave easily. <laughs> Um, And I know people are talking to somebody yesterday. They've got a dog in foster who's great. And were he in our shelter, I'm pretty sure he would go in an afternoon. But because Mm -hmm. he's in foster, it means that they're kind of a bit out of sight, out of mind. And I think there can be a bit of a mentality that that dog's okay, so let's take one from the shelter. Whereas that's not, you know, a helpful process at all. So there is that kind of side of things that when dogs go into foster, it can be very difficult to get them out again. But there's also that there is that blame culture. And sometimes it's just ourselves. Sometimes that comes from our own internal kind of feelings that I don't want to return this dog, even though I know it's not working. So for instance, I've had maybe, I don't know, 60, 70 dogs in foster in in the last five years or so. There was one dog who I just couldn't I just couldn't keep. It was a very small dog and I had a dog who was quite predatory and it was fine while I could keep my eye on them, but I couldn't leave that small dog in the same room with mm-hmm. the big dog and think that they could be safe. You know, you've got a 50 kilo dog and a five kilo dog. That's not a safe way to, to leave them. And yet the dog had really bad separation anxiety. So I couldn't, I couldn't crate him. I couldn't leave him any. I needed to go out and work at that time. I wasn't set up, but it was just me at my own home. And I, and I just couldn't keep this dog because of the, the you know, just the, the problems in the house. So there's that kind of side of things as well that many, sh- and I don't know whether it's the shelters or whether it comes from ourself. And it also when it comes from society, because mm. you, when we've got a dog who pops back up on our Facebook or on the refuge site and somebody's brought them back, you do get all the armchair warriors who are then saying, oh, you know, well, I would have kept him and blah, blah. And it just becomes this like massive blame culture from people mm. who aren't involved and don't know how hard that person tried to keep the dog. So I do think it needs to be an open door that you know I would rather no dog left on a permanent contract but I know how messy that is um because I think having an open contract means people feel like they can bring the dog back if they're not sufficiently able to cope with the dog and it's all a learning curve you know if you get a dog home and they were lovely in the shelter but they are having behavior problems that you can't cope with then you you shouldn't have to be trying to address those problems if you're not set up to do so and you don't have the capacity to do so. With the best will in the world, you can know a dog really well. I knew Liddy, like I said, she was in our shelter for three years before I adopted her. I knew that dog inside out. Mm. What I didn't prepare for 
was when I brought her home because she needed like Fort Knox. So I had Fort Knox prepared. Everything was prepared. Everything, every moment, everything had been, you know, planned in my new shy. I didn't plan for her to have enormous separation anxiety. And so that complicated things because I had another dog who had separation anxiety and I knew they couldn't be in the same room together. So I'd planned for them not being in the same room together, but I'd not planned for them both to feel unable to cope without me present. So you can take, you can do all of the best thinking in the world and not have thought about the one thing that will be a real problem for that dog. (laughs) Yeah. And I do see this on social media a lot is that we tend to, you know, there's always, I see what you were saying about, you know, cult-like sometimes in a way, and there's always you know, kind of sides with everything. And I, I think, yeah. you know, if we kind of shift the narrative and start thinking what's best for the dog and move away from pointing fingers. And look, I agree with you. I think, you know, if someone's made an informed choice, taking a dog home and they just, you know, they're it's having a hard just time and, and the dog mm-hmm. is having a hard time. Like that's not fair on, if they keep the dog, the dog's not yeah. going to be doing well. It's not going to be happy yeah. if they can't give it support. So actually it's, kind of better off going back in, in a way oh absolutely and, and I think what you're saying in terms of like it should be an ongoing relationship with you know the person who adopts and the shelter is so so important yeah just to feel I had that because when I I brought my dog Rosa home I, it was initially as a foster because they they found her as a stray in a field with her puppies and obviously puppies were adopted out super quick mm. I wanted an adult dog and they said we don't have room for in the shelter and she's just so scared she's not the kind of dog that looks like she's super friendly and jumping up and down and who people Mm want to take home and I said well I'll I'll take her I knew I'd foster and never give her back it was definitely a failed foster in a good way but I suppose um, yeah I just feel lucky that I have been able to give her the support that she needs but I completely empathize with someone who you know just feels overwhelmed and maybe now is a good time for us to talk a little bit about separate separation anxiety because it's come up mm-hmm. a couple of times and it certainly is something that you know many many dogs suffer from and it's heart-wrenching to watch my dog mm-hmm. has developed separation anxiety and it's developed progressively I could see some of the early signs of like following me around the house but unfortunately and I feel terrible for this it really didn't click in my head what was what was well, brewing? That's partly because hyper the shadowing that you're talking about is not necessarily a symptom of separation anxiety. Okay. Um, so Daniel Mills has done a lot of some really useful podcasts as well and YouTube videos, and also a very useful. I think I'm not sure who he was in with it on, but I do know he was involved in it. So the correlation between hyper attachment and separation anxiety is not a causal one, though. It's not. They're not necessarily correlative. Mm. So that can be hard. The good, the good thing is that there are really good programs for separation anxiety. The, the bad thing is that they all take time. <laughs> so, yes, you know, all of them have kind of got the same features. All of them are going to be kind of the same. And so I, there are a lot also of, se- of people who work with separation anxiety cases who work remotely, and that's fine too. So you can usually always find a practitioner, usually mm. always. You can always find a practitioner, whether it's kind of like the say SA Pro people or mm. Melina Dumas. Tini and, and her network. So there are also three really good books about separation anxiety for people who couldn't afford the support. So th- there is that kind of, we know how to treat it mm-hmm. <laughs> and we know how to deal with it. The hard thing is committing yourself to it mm. um, and being able to work through it. And also for, for, for me as a single person, it's just, it's a logistical nightmare, but it's one that gets easier and it depends on other complicating factors as well. So the first thing I'd always say is just, is video, is leave the dog for five minutes and, and have a video because you don't know what you've got. Mm. We've had the people who brought the dog back and saying the dog's got separation anxiety and the dog's bored. We've had people who, you know, have sent us a video and have gone, oh, well, your Labrador there looks like he's having a whale of a time dismantling your set- settees. And we can also, we can tell people. So the, the Labrador reminds me, we had a dog called Lawson, a Labrador, who he went to his first home, dismantled a, a couch, was brought back. So he said to the next people who, who were going to take him, because he was a lovely looking dog, 
a really lovely dog. Lawson likes dismantling settees. It's not a separation anxiety. He just, you know, it's his thing. Don't let him be alone in your front room. What did they do? Left him alone in the front room with their settee. And that was his second one. And then the third one, the same thing. So in the end, we just had to actually say, look, you can't take this dog unless you absolutely guarantee us you cannot leave this dog because unless you like having your settee dismantled. So it's knowing what, and also knowing about things like isolation distress, because I have had personally, I've had dogs who just needed another heartbeat in the room. And I've also had dogs who can't cope when I'm not there. So just as an example, I had Toby, who was my first Malinois, who just, he had isolation, what I would call isolation distress. Mm. He just needed another dog there. So I couldn't always take him out, with him, but as long as another dog was present or even a cat, as long as there was another heartbeat in the room, it's fine. If I didn't do that, the first time I left him alone, he pulled a chair over towards the window and I did the video. And the next day when I thought, oh, this is a bit strange. Why is he moving the furniture? And he was actually, he got up on the, he'd moved the couch across the window, Malinois, tried to open the window to get out because he couldn't manage and left a dog with him. So I always had a dog who had to stay at home with him. It was absolutely fine. So dogs, if you've got people who can manage that, that's fine. But you've got to know that that's isolation distress. How can you know? So people who say, oh, you know, get your dog another dog and can't necessarily know that that will solve problems. Flicker was my next dog with separation anxiety. And really hers wasn't separation anxiety either. It was containment phobia. Because what had happened was she'd worked in a warehouse for 14 years. Mm -hmm. So what they do at the end of the day is they shut the warehouse door and leave the dog to patrol. And so she'd spent 14 years every mm -hmm. single night trying to get and succeeding of getting out of the warehouse where she was supposed to be the guard dog. Mm. Um, and just if I left her and she could get out, in and out of the house, absolutely. So as long as she had, I mean, she would go outside and bark at planes and cars that passed. That was another issue. But it wasn't separation anxiety. It was containment phobia that she just mm. didn't, you know, uh, it was being shut in. You know, yeah. because I'm the kind of owner that if I if my dog moves to the door I get up and open the door for them yeah so so she always had when I was present and people can think that separation anxiety but it's not separation anxiety because mm -hmm. what it is is you're not there to open the door for them when they want to go out and okay. actually when you're there they you're a cue that mm -hmm. they could go out if they wanted to or the mm -hmm. door is open anyway so that's a learning curve and then my last girl so Flickr I could leave with a babysitter, I could leave with a dog sitter, I could leave with, you know, other people, but she just didn't like being contained. And, uh, uh, and there were other problems because she liked to bark at things, so it disturbed the neighbours. So I quite often took her to the shelter with me, and, but she didn't like being tied up in the office. If she was free to roam, that was fine, yeah. but she was actually quite a mugger as well. So if she was loose, because we do have loose dogs at the shelter, yeah. uh, she would just go up to people who were walking like really aggressive dogs and try and mug them for biscuits. So she had to be secured and she didn't like that. Uh, but that was an issue more about containment than it was yeah. about so it's understanding what you've got. And then Liddy, who's my current dog, I don't leave her very much because my other dog's got epilepsy and, you know, mm. um, I don't ever want him to have a fit when I'm not here because if he goes into status epilepticus, there'll be nothing yeah. I can do and be dead. So I need, I, I've kind of like, she's grown up with me being here. And I went to have, I can't remember what I went out for. And I left her with my mum for 30 minutes. And my mum said, I thought she was going to break out the house, you know. So that was very much, she, she didn't care. My other dog was there. She was in a familiar setting. Mm. Um, what she didn't have was me. And that was a problem actually with the dog that I'd returned to the shelter, mm. that he formed attachments so quickly and so hard that if you tried to go out, you would be running after the car, yeah. break out and run after the car. She'd be the same. She'd be over the fence and like chasing the yeah. car down the road. So partly it's knowing with what you've got because the, the treatments that we, that I would, or anyone who's dealing with separation anxiety would talk about would be very specific to, and some of them can be just managed, you know? Mm. It, it wasn't a great leap for me to leave another dog with Toby all of the time. And it wasn't a great leap for Flicker just to have, be outside and to have to, something to entertain her and, and so on. Mm. Um, with Liddy, how dealing with it is a bit different. So I think it, 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 it's knowing and understanding what the dog's specific problem is, mm. and that will be unique to the dog and being able to work with professionals who can help. And I would say one thing as well is get medication on board quickly 
because we go through all of the supplements and people are paying more for supplements that may or may not work mm. when what they need is medication. So I think I would be having an early discussion with my vet. And as my vet's in France, not very good at prescribing medication for behavioral reasons. I said to my vet, oh, you know, I didn't want medication. And you just said, why have you brought your other dog in with you? And I, I, does she need anything? And I kind of went, oh, no, she's just hyper attached. You know, she's got separation anxiety. I said, do you have any cures? And he went, don't leave her alone. <laughs> And I, you know, they're just a typical French rural vet. And he was joking on that, I was joking. But, you know, it's, I think it's very important with dogs who do have separation anxiety or any kind of other anxieties as well to get medication on board quickly rather than leaving it and thinking it should be the last resort rather than the first because it's a welfare issue. It's a huge welfare issue. So let's talk about that for a moment because I would have mm-hmm. I would have thought it would be a, a last resort well, mm-hmm. no, actually, sorry, no, that's not the right thing to say. So, because my dog doesn't have severe separation, she just cr- I have a mm-hmm. camera and she'll cry for the first 10 15 minutes and then she will calm down. I always make sure she's exercised well, has her yeah. licky mat, her Kong with peanut butter in it, her yak like she's got plenty of toys, stuff to keep her occupied. She doesn't enjoy being alone, and I try not to. Does she eat her. though? She she will, yeah. So, if I leave her, yeah, she, yeah, she, she will. She will eat. She she will actually be see, so preoccupied with the licky mat or whatever puzzle yes. I've hidden like liver treats in that she'll even realize I've gone out till I've gone out. Yeah. But if it was an extreme case, I I probably would have gone down you know the route of find a separation anxiety specialist, specialist. work through a program before thinking about medication. But what you're mm-hmm. saying is actually consider medication. I'm presuming As, alongside been- with. And, and, a, a, and a separation anxiety professional will tell you to see the vet straight away. But it, like it depends, as you said, on the severity. So for me, a dog that can eat while you're alone, well, you could actually make that worse because like, you know, sometimes we turn cues, toys into cues that we're going out and that can be a disaster. But for, for instance, I know dogs who will spend hours trying just doing nothing other than trying to get out through the door yeah um dogs who've who've no teeth left because they've removed yeah. them by chewing at the door and dogs who are defecating who are urinating you know if you've seen those signs of distress then for me mm. I, I that's a welfare issue um, yeah yeah I, I i i agree with you i just wanted us to clarify that point for listeners yeah. it's not a quick fix yeah, absolutely no it's not it really depends on how extreme because I, I was telling someone something about you know really awful cases of like really severe self-harm and yeah. i completely understand i completely understand yeah. that point so you mentioned a couple of of people who who do you, do you actually offer separation anxiety programs ever i don't i kind of refer them on to other people who do because okay. it's not my thing. Aggression is my thing. And, and okay. I don't bring my best game to separation anxiety cases, despite the fact I've lived with three yeah. um, dogs who've had issues. So I think, you know, it's just not my cup of tea. But there are very good networks of people who do offer very good support for separation related behaviours. More expert in it than me. Yeah, no, that, that makes me, if, if you're happy afterwards to send me some links and I can include them yeah, in the show notes of this episode, yeah. that'd be amazing. But maybe, maybe we can touch on, on aggression for, for, for a few minutes. Cause I think that mm-hmm. is, I know several people who've adopted dogs and, you know, some of them are adopted. They were bought from breeders and, and they, you know, they have real issues with, with the dogs displaying aggressive behavior. In fact, yesterday I witnessed something which absolutely ripped my heart to shreds it. So dog, I saw the owner was walking the dog and the dog saw another dog coming down the road and, you know, was very sensitive to other dogs and started lunging and barking. Mm -hmm. And the owner basically pulled her dog and she actually hit him on the head and was yelling at, and I just stood there and I'm like, why are you like, you're not, you know, that's beyond the Mm. fact, beyond the, beyond the fact that it was just absolutely awful and cruel thing to do to an animal Mm-hmm. You know, that aside for one second is all you've taught that dog is when another dog comes down the road not only do you have that initial fear of like that we've not analyzed oh, totally. but mm-hmm. it also means you're going to get hit and yelled at by the person who's supposed yeah, to be your totally. carer so yeah I, and I see it so often is that they just get go into this yelling match with their dog they yank the mm-hmm. dog they hit the dog or they just avoid you know, taking the dog, which probably, you know, that the, 
the most humane option is just don't expose the dog to to other dogs if it's if it's reacting that oh, way absolutely so scared but yeah. i suppose the question is like how what advice would you give to someone who has a dog you know what's the first step they can take we're not trying to solve that because it's it's really depends um, on the case but it, I think it depends because we, there, really when we're talking about aggression, we're talking about aggression in four, four ways. So you can have problems with aggression within the home with familiar dogs. So how we try and address that is to make sure that we've met all the dogs on site if possible. And sometimes we'll take the dog to the home and do the greetings off site. So a lot of that's about the greetings. It's about how it's managed. It's about, it's about understanding both of the dog or the, the number of dogs that you've got in front of you and knowing that that dog will fit into that group or could fit into that group and also having the ability to say no to a doctor's where you know it's not going to work so a lot of the problems with unfamiliar dogs can uh, sorry with familiar dogs within the home can be dealt with by the shelter offering support for putting the dogs together in the first place mm. so there's that side then there's a side about aggression towards familiar people in the home so we're really talking about resource guarding behaviors or you know towards grooming for example or hand mm -hmm. and i think the most important thing here is that i don't use punishment i will never use punishment but you cannot you cannot punish a dog that you have adopted and you have no history of so you can't use offensive behaviors with a dog if you don't know that dog because the dog will ha you haven't got the history to be able to do it mm. um and so I get a lot of people, traditional people who've adopted a dog who they don't have a learning history with, they've got no history with, and they've treated that dog like they would treat a dog that they brought up from the beginning mm. in terms of handling, like they're grabbing the dog, they're picking the dog up, they're grooming the dog, you know, mm. all of these things and don't have an idea about consent. And that can be problematic. You cannot punish a dog. Mm. Uh, when you don't have a learning history with that dog because mm. all that will happen is the dog will turn on you yeah and we don't talk often enough i don't think about this fallout of using punishers with dogs mm. it's in our contract that they will not use punishers for this reason yeah. and that goes from water sprays and citronella collars right the way up you know even reprimands right the way up and also that they won't use particular trait that we know use because it's rural france they use whips they use chains they, they you know oh, okay. um okay. there are all kinds of they the local trainer is known as Mr. Whippy, you, you know, so he is uh, not a trainer that we would recommend. So I think a lot of that kind of like ha for people themselves is to understand that where you punish a dog, even if you just say no to the dog, when you don't know that dog, that you, you have not got that ability to, to do that and know how that will turn out for you. Yeah. Um, then there's aggression towards unfamiliar dogs, so the reactive dog that we might talk about, or even attacking other dogs. And most shelters should have behaviourists that they can work with, who because that's a common problem. You know, there's lots of dogs that they don't like other dogs, and the same with unfamiliar people. But that tends to be fairly incidental and just how only happen on walks. Mm. So those are the behaviours you know that you just need people who have got some skill to be able to support the the adopter out and out in public and help the dog feel a little bit better about mm. the world around them you know but it's it's not as pressing as a dog who's aggressive towards a dog in the home or a dog who's aggressive towards a family member yeah um i just want to look back to to what you were saying around punishment or use of aversives you talk about there needs to be a relationship with the dog mm -hmm. to ever even think about using those sorts mm -hmm. of yeah. approaches or techniques. But and you're saying that you don't use them. How would you mm -hmm. then work with a dog that, you know, a large dog that really does have some very sensitive to either people or other dogs and is displaying very aggressive behaviors? How do you use the would it be positive reinforcement techniques? you know just maybe always. a very high level yeah <laughs> always so it, it depends i mean i do have per clients not dogs who aren't coming in the shelter but that actually for some of the dogs who've arrived in our shelter who've been removed from homes where they've been punished excessively i mean i we've taken dogs who've been tasered that they're in the protection sports industry that the the guys are trying to out a bite and i've been called i was called in once by a guy and he said to me i said what are these little marks over the dog's body you know it just looks like cigarette burns i didn't say that and he said oh it's a taser oh god a taser okay why did you tase your dog oh well he, he won't stop biting because he's been doing protection sports industry work with him and so obviously that was a dog that was then removed from that situation because you know can't work with an owner that's doing that but a lot of the 
people who've used punishers who've caused problems for mm. the dog very big protection sports industry in France it causes a lot of problems so we get a lot of Malinois a lot of German shepherds that come in who've lost trust in the humans that they were with mm. but coming into the shelter it's a different environment they've got people they trust and they can rebuild in, uh, relationships yeah. with them which is good but then as you were talking about dogs who were just kind of react to reactive to other dogs well it de- that again it depends in rural France you can take your dog for walks for weeks and not see another dog mm. so it's not an impossibility to that mm. kind of dog should not be going in to live in a place where they're going to be surrounded by dogs the whole time yeah saying that I'm currently on a caravan site where every person on this site owns you know small shih tzus chihuahuas barky dogs dogs who are going nuts all day long and Liddy who is still very problematic with dogs lives there so Mm -hmm. even when you live in a very dog populated area you can make it a lot easier on yourself by the walks that you choose, the time that you're choosing to go out, mm. um, the way that you do things. Mm. And again, it's all positive reinforcement. So we, it depends on the dog and it depends on, you know, the capacity of the owner and, and how prepared they are, how capable they are of doing various different techniques and so on. Mm. Um, but you can get to a point where it's, you know, it's manageable yeah. <laughs> at the very yeah. least. Yeah. You must, you must, you, over the course of the past several years, you must have seen so many different cases, complicated cases. Yeah, well, we're an open door shelter Mm. and we're no kill shelter. So we have a very good adoption rate for rehomable dogs mm. um so we you know if you bring in us coming through the pound so if we get an adoptable family dog that comes in through the pound or even you know a little a little almost semi-feral chihuahua will go within an afternoon and mm. people won't care that the little chihuahua is an absolute sod so because we've got that good turnover people do drive a long way to get to our shelter to leave a dog with us and so for instance we've had a number of dogs that have come four or five hundred miles to be left with us because Mm. the owner didn't have any other choice and the other shelters weren't taking on the dog Mm. so we do feel like sometimes I'm warehousing that we're warehousing dogs that are problematic Mm. um you know and that in itself is a challenge but uh, you know put them in the right environment and give the owners the right support and then generally you don't tend to see the problems that are still there Mm. but you can just find a better situation for the dog than the one that they were in perhaps yeah it's 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 all I feel like it's always a work in progress you know yeah yeah yeah. and I I also think this it's an amazing journey even you know I still have challenges with with my dog Rosa but it's just very rewarding to watch her evolve and settle in and even though settling means I'm starting to see some interesting behaviors it's just, still, it's just so I've, I just find it wonderful to to see her grow in confidence that she's yeah feels brave enough that she can really test the boundaries I just yeah I, absolutely yeah, I, yeah, I, yeah. I, th- I think it's, um, it's a good thing a lot of our clients who do take on uh, our adopters who do take on challenging dogs our challenging dogs leave on a bridging contract and I think that's another thing that shelters can do mm. so the bridging contract basically means that the support for the dog when they go into the new home And that's a service that I offer as well for other associations in our area that we know there's a dog who's been problematic in foster or that's been problematic with the adopters who had them. And then how can we make this easier for the person who's going to take them on Mm. is to make sure that they leave on a bridging contract. So that is an open contract. So the dog can come back if they need to. But there are, you know, a number of sessions put in there to support the the dog in the, and that works really well. Mm. So that's one way that, Uh, people can ask something of the shelter to kind of like support the dog past the life in the shelter yeah make it a bit easier as well Mm. and do you you, because you're saying you support other associations Mm. um so do you do that online or is it also okay okay and then do you do that just with associations and other shelters or also with individuals? But through the, the the associations, really. So they contact me and say they've got a dog who's got X, Y problem, especially with, you know, more significant problems mm. and certain breeds. So where, you know, I've got a little bit more expertise on certain behaviours mm. um, and can just point them generally in the right direction and say, OK, here, 
maybe this will help yeah um, yeah and support them in that way but yes that's that's how it works fantastic it's it's been a real pleasure chatting with you today before we go let our listeners know where they can find find out more about you and your fantastic blog because there's so many great posts on there <laughs> that I think everyone who's even thinking about adopting a dog should should read so it's called Wolf Like to Meet. And the idea was this kind of, kind of dating service, if you like, to match people up with the right dog for them, but to make life a little bit easier. So the, there's every, every, every problem that's ever existed under the sun is on there. And there's more extended posts as well that go over a series about how to deal with things like dogs who are lunging and, and reacting in the street or dogs who are having particular problems. So that's Wolf Like to Meet. And that's uh, just Facebook and, and also a website. I will link to those in the show notes of this episode then. Thank oh you so God. much for joining me, Emma. Thanks for having me.